We are in the series following Jesus as we walk through the Gospel of Mark, and this morning we are looking at Jesus' Jordan moment and reflecting on our own Jordan moment in our lives. In Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15, at that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts and minds this morning. Well, as I said, we're in the series following Jesus, and this morning we have a Jordan moment. Man, I don't know if you remember your baptism or you've seen pictures of your baptism. Uh, Back, maybe it was when you uh, were a baby, as we're doing this morning with Lee Mathen. We're so excited about that precious, tender moment and his life, and you might recall yours or your family's when you baptize a son or a daughter. Or you, you might be like me, where you grew up in a, in a church where we did baptism a little later in life. We did it kind of like a confirmation as part of that. And for us, we lived out in the country in a small uh, farm in Pennsylvania, and uh, we had a mud pond. I do mean a mud pond. It was about uh, three quarters of an acre, a little bigger than that. And it was, it was mud. We made it and uh, cut it out of the earth. And the water was muddy and the banks were muddy. We had the greatest time in there. But our church's baptismal moments were in our pond. And so the, the deal was you would uh, wade out into the water. And you had to be really careful because, as I said, the banks were muddy. And it was this kind of blue clay that was just slick as can be. And if you didn't watch it, you could, you know, slip and slide down there unintentionally. So there's one or two people there, and occasionally you could take all three people out. So some people were sort of whispering that that might happen and hoping, believe it or not, that that might happen. And, but hopefully it didn't for you. And then go out into the muddy waters, and then you were, you were dipped down into the muddy waters and came up. And when you came up, people would sing a song. And, and so that was cool. And sometimes a fish would jump, too, <laughs> just like applause from heaven. So in my Jordan moment, in my baptismal moment, well, I remember, you know, waiting out there, wondering if I was going to take the slippery mudslide there version. Uh, and I remember going down, thinking, this is a long time to come up. And then when I came up, there was like a fish that jumped. And people, I didn't know if people were applauding for the fish or for me, but they did sing a song. And so that was, uh, that was beautiful, special. However, your baptismal moment is beautiful. I've done some baptisms in the ocean, which is kind of cool. And then as part of our Holy Land trip, uh, we weren't rebaptized because we don't do that, but we were affirmed in baptism and got a chance to go out into the Jordan River and be dipped into that. And that was really special too. But whatever your Jordan moment is, it's special. And this morning we begin looking at the Jordan moment of Jesus. And it's a, it's a beautiful moment. Now, For a lot of folks, when you see pictures of Jesus' baptism, you know, sort of renditions, it's this beautiful spa-like blue crystal Mediterranean kind of water, all right? And it looks, the sun's glistening off, it's just beautiful. And and that's a nice rendition, but having been to the Jordan River, I can tell you that it is really muddy. It is every bit as muddy as our pond in Pennsylvania, but it's still so special. And so when you look at this moment this morning, and Jesus' life, as Jesus called in this moment, and John the Baptist, as we said last week, in his attitude of, of servanthood and his attitude of following Jesus and attitude of pointing to Jesus, he follows Jesus' instruction, and Jesus wades out into this muddy water. And it seems to me that in this moment, in our minds, however we conceive of that, we can do one of two things with the muddy waters of the River Jordan. We can either sort of clean it up so it looks resort like in crystal blue Mediterranean, or we might hear God's subtle whisper to us that maybe the muddy waters of the Jordan River have a secret spiritual truth that God is whispering to us this morning. And that's the path that I'd like us to take this morning as we look at this Jordan moment. And so Jesus wades into the muddy waters of the Jordan River, and I like it 
that remembering that Jesus did walk on the water, but not in this moment. In this moment, Jesus wades into the muddy waters, which has a spiritual truth. Every bit as deep and profound as what we'll look at later in Jesus' ministry, which is walking on the water. So I like to hear that people are listening. That's really cool, especially the kids. But in this moment, Jesus wades into the muddy waters of the Jordan River. And I think Gospel of Mark, who begins in this mission apostle, action-packed moment, who has John the Baptist, we're told, baptizing the entire Judean countryside. And we're told that people are confessing their sins, they're baptized by him into the River Jordan, and it's after that moment that Jesus is baptized. And I think that is a powerful lesson for us. You see, it wasn't just water that's muddy. Jesus was also walking into the sin and shortcomings of our life, into the hurt and heartbreak of our lives. And Jesus was transforming that by his life as Emmanuel God come to us. And the mission that he began in that moment to journey to the cross and the resurrection, to pay the price for our sins and shortcomings, to participate with us and transform our hurt and heartbreak and to make it into something new. Where are you this morning in your life? You know, you might sometimes feel like you're having a Jordan moment in the muddy waters. And maybe that's the sin or shortcomings of the past or present, the brokenness sometimes that we feel. Maybe it's hurt or betrayal or heartbreak. Um, maybe you've also been uh, grieving the loss of a loved one. Or you have one who's ill or you yourself is ill and you feel like your life is, is broken and you're part of that muddy waters. And I think in that moment that, that the Gospel of Mark wants us to know that Jesus is wading in to the hurt and brokenness the dirt and grit of our lives. And Jesus is willing to do that. Is God Emmanuel with us? From the birth, sharing, as a baby, vulnerable and fragile in a cradle, all the way up through his teen years and in this moment. People once said, we don't hear much about Jesus' teenage years. Other theologians have reflected, maybe that's, there's a good reason for that. <laughs> Remember your teenage life. We don't believe that about Jesus, but it's interesting. But John just, bam, he puts us right there at the Jordan moment of life. But maybe in your own life. I don't care whether it's the teen years or your golden years or whatever it is. We all have some hurts and heartbreaks. And maybe part of that is how you're feeling this morning. And that's fine because Jesus wades with love and care and concern and God's heart into the hurt and brokenness into the heartbreak of our lives, into the shortcomings of our life to make all things new and to give God's promise of love to us. There's a beautiful story that I love uh, about Father Damien on the island of Malachi, Hawaii, back in the late part of the 18th century, early part of the 19th century. And back then, leprosy was believed to be incurable. And it was, you know, same as Jesus' time. Didn't know it was caused by a microvirus and a uh, horrible disease for the body because it was progressive, made the fingers and limbs white, sometimes eventually fell off. But the worst thing was probably they were pushed outside of society because of the fear of leprosy, which is, you know, uh, well-founded in many respects. They didn't know how to cure it or handle it, and so they were pushed outside. They couldn't see their family or anyone. In Jesus' time in, in Hawaii, they dedicated an island where all the lepers go, called Malachi. And in Malachi, Hawaii, no one would go there, except for lepers. But one day, Father Damien felt God's call to go and minister to the people of Malachi, the lepers there. And so for years, he would take his message of love and grace and forgiveness out to the lepers, and he would always say, God loves you lepers. Not just everybody, but God loves you lepers. And, and it had an impact on people's lives. But then after a number of years, Father Damien woke up one day and looked at his fingers and realized that he had contracted leprosy himself. And he was horrified at first, but then he realized that his call was to continue to do exactly what he was doing before, which is to convey God's love to the lepers. But on that particular morning, everybody heard that Father Damien had contracted leprosy, and they wanted to hear what he had to say. And as he went out there, his message became as it was that day and every day since. Instead of God loves you lepers, it was God loves us lepers. Instead of God loves you lepers, it was God loves us lepers. And a powerful ministry in Malachi, Hawaii. And today, there's a monument to Father Damien there that you can go and visit. 
I think it's a beautiful picture of Jesus wading into the Jordan River, of Jesus, God, Emmanuel, God with us, wading into the hurt and heartbreak and sin and shortcomings of our lives to heal the brokenness, to mend us, to make us whole. But there's something that's at least as important as that, and that's the message of God in that moment. As Jesus is coming out of the waters of the Jordan moment, the Spirit descends like a dove. The Holy Spirit, the Jesus promise, because I go to the Father that I will send the Comforter to you, the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit lights on Jesus, and the voice from heaven says, Behold, my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. There's different versions of that. My favorite is, Behold, my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. What a beautiful moment. But it wasn't just for Jesus. Jesus' call was special. Jesus' call was one and only as the Son of God. But Jesus was also the one who would invite us to follow him. And because of Jesus' Jordan moment, our lives are transformed, and you and I can hear that whisper of God as well. You and I can hear the whisper of God, behold my beloved son or daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. God knows about our sins and shortcomings, our brokenness. That's why Jesus was sent as Emmanuel, God with us. Not just for Christmas, but all the way to Calvary, all the way to the cross to bridge love and justice, the sin and shortcomings of our life, and bring healing and new life and the promise of eternal life to us. And so in that moment, Jesus hears the Father's whisper before he begins his ministry. Behold, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And I hope you as parents say that to your son or daughter. My daughter will tell you that every single day I say two phrases to you. I love you and I'm proud of you. I love you and I'm proud of you. If she's away, I send her a text. I do emojis too because I had to learn emoji eventually because other people were emojiing her. So she had to learn that dad is going to learn emoji so I can do that too. But I always say that. I love you and I'm proud of you. Every day is not perfect, right? But I love you and I'm proud of you. I hope you say that to your kids and grandkids too. If they need a little correction or redirection, I hope you say that before and after, whatever you say. I love you, I'm proud of you. So important to hear that. And in that moment, because of what Jesus did, we can hear the Father, the creator of us, whisper those words, behold, look, my beloved son, my beloved daughter, I'm proud of you. I'm so pleased with you. I have a plan and purpose for your life that is bigger and better than you'd ever imagine. And I know that you've fallen short. I know that you have some brokenness and hurt and heartbreak. But because of that Jordan moment and because of the Calvary and the resurrection, your life is all new. I've been there with you and I'm still with you there today. Maggie J, on behalf of her, Matt, sent me a scripture verse, which I know is one of her favorite ones. And uh, for Lee Matthew, we're going to read a little bit later, but I want to share it with you because I think it's beautiful. Marianne read it earlier. From Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, this is the version that I like the best from that. And it's this, for we are God's handiwork, which also means artwork masterpiece, created in Jesus Christ, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's masterpiece, God's works of art that God has created, that God has sculpted. And in Jesus Christ, all things are new, and we are invited to do good works, not to earn God's love, but in return for God's love. Not to earn God's love, but in return for God's love. Do you feel like a work of art today? Maybe you've been a little broken and scuffed and the world's been hard on you. Well, you're still God's handiwork. God loves you enough to send Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior to not only to create you, but to redeem and remake you in Jesus Christ. To take that Jordan moment and to invite you to follow Jesus Christ. To follow Christ, to hear the words of the Father, the Creator, say, Behold, my beloved son or daughter, I'm proud of you. I'm so well pleased. And to invite the Holy Spirit to come to you gently like a dove and to lead you into the path. Now, I want you to notice something. 
Everything wasn't perfect after that moment. In fact, what happens immediately? John uses a word that he uses over 40 times in that moment, which is immediately right now, Jesus is pulled by the Spirit into the wilderness for temptation. Well, that's not what you wanted to hear, is it? <laughs> but you know why? Because that's real life. And Jesus went through that too, being tempted, being tormented, being accused by the accuser, even as we are, even greater than we are. So he would experience that and invite us to follow him through that. And then what did it say? He was tended to by animals. I don't know. He's an animal person. I like that. Feels good. All right. But he was attended to by angels. In the midst of temptation, in the midst of the wilderness, in the midst of heart and heartbreak and all that's going on in life, Jesus was ministered to by angels. And we are too. And if you stand there in that moment, which I was so privileged to be part of that, the Jordan River is the lowest place on the planet, is the lowest elevation on the planet. You can look it up. So Jesus descended to the lowest part of the planet, to the lowest, humblest part of the planet. And from there, you can see what's called the Mount of Temptation, which is a mountain that is a desert. I promise you that. And went there. God led him through that, but the angels ministered to him. And the angels will minister to you in the wilderness if you look for them and you listen for them. And sometimes it's a heavenly angel. Sometimes it's an earthly angel. Angel means messenger. And sometimes you can be the messenger and the angel for someone else to encourage them along life's way. Not to point out all that's wrong, but to remind them that God loves them and that God's proud of them. That God has a pathway for them. That God's Holy Spirit is there to encourage them and help them to grow in that moment of discipleship, to follow Jesus. It's not a once and done. It's a beginning that has a journey. And so this is a journey that we have today. A journey that we are so delighted and honored to be part of Lee Matthew's life and the whole family, the church family, but also in our, in our own lives. Where are you in your journey moment? Do you need to look back and just give God thanks for that moment? Or maybe this is a moment you don't need to wade into the water. Just be reminded that Jesus did that for you. Jesus walked and waded into the muddy Jordan waters, the sin and hurt and brokenness and shortcomings of our life, into the hurt to be there with us, to heal it, to transform us, to invite us to follow him into a new life that he was making for us and that he would always be there, even as through the wilderness, even as feeling the voices of angels whisper, and then what does Jesus do? Begins the ministry to spreading the good news, which we are invited to hear and to share with others the good news of Jesus Christ. One of the psalms that I love so much is Psalm 40, which we use for the call to worship. And I don't know whether you know this or not, or whether you are a U2 and Bono fan. U2 is actually not U2. You know, there's a U2. It's a group for if you're not in that generation. But Bono, sort of a classic, but he wrote a poem, song entitled 40, that he wrote when he was 40, but it's a reflection on Psalm 40, which he thought pictured his life in that moment, sort of looking back, some of the brokenness wasn't perfect, did a lot of great things, but also looking forward to the promise. And I think it's beautiful for us too in a, in a Jordan moment of our own, and it was sort of a Jordan moment for him too. And I wanna read it again and offer that to you. He wrote a little commentary, I think it's in the Messenger Bible on that, but it's a great poem too. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. It lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock that is Jesus Christ. He gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Beautiful, powerful. I want to close with this thought. I was listening to uh, Richard Foster, one of my writers that I like. He wrote Celebration of Discipline and Prayer, a number of other things. But he did lectures. He was doing a lecture tour of different college campuses around the country. And he delivered this one lecture, and he always had a little Q&A time. And to ask for people to share, you know, sort of epiphany moments in their life, even Jordan moments in their life. And this one man 
There was an older gentleman who shared that he'd always wanted to go and visit Mother Teresa in India back when she was alive. Just a wonderful saint of modern times. The ministry that she did with the poor orphans and writing and touching people's lives in so many powerful ways. And so he spent a number of years writing um, Mother Teresa and the followers there because she's a very busy person and finally got an okay to go to India and to visit Mother Teresa and uh, to share in the ministry there. And so he got there with high hopes that it was like gonna be a retreat thing, <laughs> sort of the spa moment thing, if you will. And then uh, he got there and Mother Teresa kind of just, you know, sort of commissioned people to do stuff. And his task, he was told, was to take the clothes, the dirty clothes from the orphanage and from the hospital and to take them down into this muddy river and wash them because they didn't have washing machines then. You know, they're out in the middle of nowhere. And so the best they could do is take all the, all the, you know, the bloody clothes from the hospital and all the dirty clothes from the orphanage and to wade out into that river and to wash them. And so he was not thrilled about that. That's not what he wanted. He wanted this retreat moment with Mother Teresa. So he did what he was asked to do, which was he took those clothes one by one and uh, baskets of them, just thought it was endless. And he was out there washing them. And for a while, he really felt indignant about it. You know, could be asked to do something that menial, that humiliating, right? And um, so he's washing them. And then, you know, for a moment, he begins to think about, you know, these are, these are the clothes of someone who's in the hospital. These are the clothes of some orphan that's hurting. And so he began to pray for each set of clothes that he washed, washed them as best he could, even this dirty water. And then, he said it was like a Holy Spirit moment. He started to, to cry. And he, re he realized that this was something that Jesus did in our lives. That Jesus waded into the dirt, hurt of humanity. Jesus individually washed our clothes, transformed him in a powerful way, our hurt. And he related how in that moment, his whole life was transformed. The idea of, of ministry, what it meant to follow Christ as he was out there in those muddy waters in India and his life was changed. And later he did get his moment with Mother Teresa, shared that with her. And uh, Richard Foster said, what a beautiful moment. He said, you know, clothes are a symbol of our individual human lives, our personality we put into them and they need to be washed and, you know, do contain some of our, our hurt and heartbreak. And in doing so, he was participating in the lives of those people. And even though he didn't know their names and whether in the hospital bed or in an orphanage, wherever they were, maybe they were widowed and they were in a shelter for women or wherever they were, and by praying for them and participating and doing the best he could, that he really was part of the ministry of Jesus Christ and the beautiful ministry of Mother Teresa. And sometimes we're called to exactly that too to have our Jordan moment where we are washed by Christ. But Jesus invites us to follow him. That's what the invitation is, as we'll see along the way. To be that servant leader, to be willing to get our hands dirty in humanity and to offer Christ's love to others and to pray at every moment, even though we can't always make other people's lives completely new, but we know the one who can, which is Jesus Christ. And you and I, together, as a family of faith, are invited in that journey of faith and are invited into that ministry of faith today. We are so excited to be part of a Jordan moment for Lee Matthew as a family and as a church family, but we're all on that journey too because Jesus invites us into a Jordan moment that only he makes possible through God's love. Hear God's voice today. Behold, my beloved son, Behold, my beloved daughter, in you I am well pleased. I am proud of you. I will make all things new through the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we're so thankful for your Jordan moment in history and in our lives. Help us to follow you. Help us to allow you to wash our lives and make them new. And help us to follow you as we share in your ministry, willing to participate and to help make all things new. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.